This is from a, a man called Dennis Goldsworthy Davis. For those of you who want to check it out, want is a big part of his thing at the moment, like 2023, 20, 24, it's all about want. And uh, so you can see him on, on YouTube, but what he spoke was just amazing. I think I took over 20 pages of notes um, and then just connecting with people, like intercessors in Alaska who are protecting their borders against China and, and you know connecting with other people. It was just the most amazing time. But I wanted to talk about this because when he was speaking, I got really um, convicted because I thought, yeah, you know, I want my own home. I want a venue for open heaven. But when, after he'd finished speaking, I thought, dear Lord, I'm passive. I had let myself go back to, well, yeah, God, in your way and in your time, instead of keeping the demand up in the realm of the spirit. So when I, I share this, I'm not wanting to upset anybody. I'm not wanting to do anything like that to anyone. But what I am saying is that we need to understand that um, there is a power in the things that you want. But it must not take the place of Christ. It must not become more than God. It must not become an idol. Um, you know, because sometimes we can want things so much that um, everything is sort of like geared around when it happens or why it hasn't happened. But the thing is, we, sub we submit it to God. But the power of the want is amazing. So I just want to share that with you, and then I just want to worship. The power of your want. So, Father, we just come before you right now in the name of Jesus. And, Father God, we thank you that we are a people who are word-fed and spirit-led. We thank you, Father, that everything we do is word-based. And we thank you for the revelation of your word. We thank you that Jesus Christ is the living word of God. And we thank you for the breath of the Holy Spirit that fills our lungs, the breath of the Holy Spirit that ministers to us, the breath of God himself who fills our being. And so I thank you, God, that we are a people that are word-fed and spirit-led. And as we come around your word today, I pray that you would minister to us that areas in our life where we've had wants, but we've uh, laid them down or let them die or uh, haven't pursued them with passion, uh, or maybe pursued them in the wrong way, Father. I pray that you would just minister to us uh, if there's any hurt, if there's any negativity. Lord, I pray that you would heal us of anything that is not right. Bring us back into truth and let the power of the want bring us into a closer relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we start off with Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. <laughs> yes. Well, what that basically means is that our shepherd is so good to us that every want is met in him. Everything, whatever we want, it's met in Christ. He opens that up to us. But the power of the want, how much do you want what you want? Like, like I said before, I really want our own venue. I want my own home. Um, but then I'd sort of, because I'd been wanting for so long, I'd fallen back into, oh, well, God, in your way, in your timing, whatever, you know, still believing, but yes, God. I was, you know, so, but that's passivity. And that's giving in to, because let me tell you something. Unmet wants and unmet needs can release a spirit of witchcraft. Because anything that manipulates, intimidates, or dominates is witchcraft. It doesn't always have to be old lady hags with, you know, witch hats. Anything that manipulates, intimidates, or dominates is witchcraft. So if you have an unmet need, a financial need, or if you have something that's a doctor's report, and it worries you to the place where that worry starts to consume you, and that starts to be all you think about you, there is actually a spirit of witchcraft released in that situation. Does this make sense? Because sometimes we don't talk about these things. So if we have an unmet want or an unmet need and we allow it to fester and instead of like, you know, contentedly or whatever, but we allow it to fester, a spirit of witchcraft is released which then opens the door for all kinds of stuff. 
So this comes to a place where we have to recognise what is being released through the way we feel emotionally and the way we think. Because the mind of the flesh will never be an enemy of, will never be a friend of God. It will always be an enemy. And if I am looking for something to fill a place in my heart, I don't know how to phrase this. If I'm looking for something, you know, I desperately want this. I really want this. But if it is more important to me than my relationship with God, then that is out of, that is out of order. We must be able to do an, an Abraham and lay our Isaac on the altar. Lay it down and surrender it back to God. But allow God to resurrect it the way he wants. We've got to be able to surrender. We've got to be able to release. So it comes back to what exactly is it that you want? What is it that you want? And let me tell you what God wants. God wants sons and daughters. God wants people, you know, um, to be Christ-like. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. Romans 8, 28, 29. We are assured and know that all things work together for our good because we love God and are called according to his, his purpose. And then it says, for those whom he foreknew, um, he also destined from the beginning to be moulded into the image of his son, that he might become the firstborn among many brethren, and whom he'd foreordained, he called, and those he called, he justified, and then those he justified, he's glorified. So what he's actually saying is that what God is looking for is Christ-like sons and daughters. That is our original destiny. That is our true assignment, that we would be the image and likeness of God on the earth. But what is it that you want? And I'm not talking about, I just want to have a cup of tea without being interrupted. I'm not talking about, I just want a holiday or a new car. I'm talking about those deep-seated wants that were placed in us on the day we were born. Because do you know that when you were born, God was there at your birth and he welcomed you? You know the name Yahweh. You don't use your tongue or your teeth when you say the name Yahweh. Yahweh. It's your breath. Yahweh. So when a baby cries, the very first thing they say is Yahweh. And when a person dies, the very last thing they breathe is the name Yahweh. So important. But when you were born, even before the beginning of the world, God placed wants in you, desires in you. Desire, desire means of the Father. He placed his desires in you so that you would live a fulfilled life. What happens is our parents tell us you can't do it, you can't have it, you're too dumb, you're not dumb, you're not, you know, not enough money, we can't educate, whatever it is. Parents say stuff, teachers say stuff. The things that you listen to little kids around the age of five, they're going to you know, walk on the moon, they're going to be a fireman, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. By the time they've been in school, two years, they've lost all of that. All the creativity, all the imagination, they've lost it. They're now colouring in between the lines. That's what I loved about when we did Shabbat at your place. Danielle, it was your sheep. You're wild. We all had to colour in, make a sheep. So we're pasting in, um, you know, cotton wool on the sheep and cutting up paddle pops for its legs and sticks and all this kind of stuff. But Danny's sheep was wild. It was rainbow coloured. It was spiky. It was amazing. There was another one there with tats and an earring. <laughs> And here am I, good little Suzette, making sure that I'm in the lines and it looks like a sheep. <laughs> Pathetic. But, you know, but this is what, the, the thing that, that happens is that we lose what God places in us. And he places his desires within you. And it's never too late. It's never too late. 
you're never too old. You're never without the resources. He's willing to blow on that, that want, that desire at any time. He's willing to blow the dust off it, to blow the excuses off it, to blow the pain off it and, cause, and bring it back to a fresh new life. But we have to settle in our hearts, what do you want? Blind Bartimaeus, Jesus asked him, what do you want? And he said, I want to see. In fact, he, he wanted so much that he threw off his beggar's coat. Like, you know, the only thing he had to bring on in a living, he threw it off and jumped up and went to Jesus because I want to see. That's what I want. I want to see. Jesus asked him and he answered. He ran to Jesus. He responded to the question. He wasn't polite. He wasn't civil. He wasn't, um, what's another word? He wasn't any of those things. Com yeah, he just, it was all in like, oh my gosh, I've got the attention of Jesus. I want to see. Ripped off his beggar's coat. Went to, I want to see. And Jesus said, okay. The woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. She wasn't necessarily asked what she wanted. It's Mark, um, Mark chapter 5. 27 to 28. She had a, verse 25 said she'd had a flow of blood for 12 years and she'd endured much suffering under the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had. Oh, I've got to take my shoes off. Oh, God. And was no better, but instead grew worse. And she'd heard the reports concerning Jesus. She'd heard about Jesus. What have you heard about Jesus that will change your life? And I'm not talking about being born again. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about what is it that you've heard about our Yeshua, our Master, our Saviour, our King, that can change right where you are right now? What have you heard? What are you mulling over? What are you thinking about? What is it in Jesus that really is touching your heart right now? What is it that he's pouring into you and he's saying, I just want you to respond. Come, come to me, come to me, come to me. What is it that he's, he's, he's nudging you about? You know, sometimes he plays hide and seek. Has anyone ever realised that God likes to play hide and seek? Yes. Just when I think I'm getting close, just when I think intimacy is flowing, Yes, I'm in this place. Oh, God, I love it. God, I love spending time with you. Next prayer meeting in my room. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Is there anyone here? Hello? But he plays hide and seek because he wants to draw you deeper. Come deeper. Come deeper. There's more I want to show you. So we can't be reliant upon what we think, what we feel, what we experience. It's all about the relationship. But she had heard about Jesus. Sometimes we become pretty complacent about what we've heard about our Jesus. Like, what have you heard? What's, what's causing the fire in you to soar, to burn with a passion and a rage? What, what have you heard about Jesus? I said, just, you know, like, oh, my gosh, I've never seen this about Jesus before. This is amazing. Oh, Jesus, I love you. And it churns up something on the inside. What is it that you've heard? And sometimes we think, oh, that's nice. That's nice. And we let the revelation just slip by. Instead of realising that in that thing that we've heard about our king, about our lover, about our saviour, about our Lord, about our healer, our deliverer, our baptizer, about the one who gave his life for you, about our coming bridegroom, we sometimes let that slip because, oh, yeah, I know Jesus. Do you really? How much do you know him? How much? He's awesome. But she'd heard something. And what she'd heard couldn't leave her. And she'd been unwell for 12 years. She was unclean, which meant every time she sat down, the chair was unclean. Every time she cooked a meal, the utensils were unclean. She couldn't go into the temple. She was unclean. There was a whole heap of things that she, you know, like it just had affected her whole life. So obviously she wanted to be well. Yes. 
But it wasn't that she was chasing healing so much as she was chasing Jesus. I had heard about Jesus. And I just knew that if I could get close enough to him, just touch the hem of his garment, I'd be made whole. It was Jesus that was the priority over the healing. She knew that the healing would flow out of him. Right? So what have you heard about Jesus that matches the want in your life? She had heard that he could heal. That's what she'd heard that matched her want. But what in Jesus matches your want, if that makes sense? What have you heard? Are you, what are you willing to chase after? It's a bit like the woman in the Song of Solomon. I'm looking for my lover. Where is he? I can't rest till I find him. When were you passionate to get into the presence of Jesus? Men and women are like, it doesn't matter what sex we are. It's about a relationship with Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the majestic one, the King of glory. How hungry are you to get in his presence? to kneel at his feet, to dance with him, to talk with him. So she had heard. And the Amplified said that she kept saying, she kept saying, faith comes by hearing. She kept saying, if I only touch his garments, I'll be restored to, to health. And immediately her flow of blood was dried up at the source and she felt in her body that she was healed of her ailment. And Jesus, verse 30, recognising in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around immediately in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? He wasn't even aware of her. There was a multitude around him. He wasn't even aware that she had touched him. He asked, who touched me? Because I felt the power go. I felt the draw of faith upon me. Come on, when was the last time you actually drew on Jesus with a faith? Instead of just an assumption. Instead of just, well, he's answered that prayer. I guess he'll answer this one. We've got to have a wild passion. We've got to have a... Ah, oh, come on. Like it's so much more than just oh, sitting on our backsides in church. <laughs> so much more. It's about living a life that releases Christ everywhere we go. It's about changing things. It's about being a transformer. You are transformed by his presence on the inside. Who else are you going to transform? It's about living in the holy place so you can release what, you know, the holiness of God, shift atmospheres, change things. Oh, come on. You know, this is why the want that he's placed in us is so important. So we come together and we can release the government of God upon the earth as the ecclesia. We can receive a kiss from Jesus as his bride, you know, because the bridegroom cherishes the bride. We can receive approval by the Father. But what is the want in you that will cause a release of heaven on earth? What is that want? What is that want? You just want to find a wild Holy Ghost time. Awesome. Have it. But then you've got to take it outside into the world. And our wants are designed to change the world. Not just our lives, but the people out there who have no hope, no covenant, no salvation, lost, caught up in futility. What is your want? I really believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is standing here and he's asking each and every one of you, what is it that you want? But we're going to have to come at it in a fresh way if it's an old want that hasn't yet materialised. So she had, she had, think about it, she was an unclean woman. She should not have been on the streets. Any person who touched her would have been made unclean. Can you imagine how many people in that crowd would have been made unclean as she's crawling through trying to touch the hem of his garments? 
She comes in front of Jairus, who's the leader of the temple. He knows the people in his village. He knows that she hasn't entered the temple in 12 years. She's unclean. He could have stopped anything from happening if he had decided to be religious, but he had his own need, his daughter that was dying. Now, his daughter was 12. So for the, all the years that his daughter had been alive, this woman had been ill. Same amount of time. 12, government. So she had to make a decision. When we decide that we're going to chase after our want, you are going to find that there's going to be a lot of conflict that's going to come. First of all, if I was truly the person that could have that want, I would have it. So what it means is if I have not yet got that want, it means I'm not yet the person that I should be. I haven't grown enough, matured enough, whatever it might be, right? There's always an element in us that's, that's got to grow. If I want a brand new car that's really posh and costs heaps of money, then I've got to grow into a wealthier woman so that I can organise the insurance and the tyres. I remember my boss used to have a, what did they have? Ferrari, Ferrari and Lamborghinis. The cost of one tyre alone could feed me for 12 years, basically. <laughs> it was like, how much did you spend on a tyre change? Like, how much was that tyre? How much was that tyre? <laughs> the tyre? I think my car's not worth that amount. So, you know, there's a whole heap of things. We'd have to, we have to change. This is all about growth. Like, who do you have to become so you can live your want? Does that make sense? So she had, to, she had to change this woman with the issue of blood. She had to think about, well, if I can just touch the hem of his, how am I going to get there? Like, I need a plan. How am I going to... She had to strategize. She had to get through a lot of confusion. A lot, what do I, I don't understand. I don't understand how this is going to work. I can't see a plan. I can't see a way forward. There would be doubt. There would be ignorance. There would be unbelief. And then she's got to make some plans. Like, oh, I think I could do this. If I could just get through the crowd to touch him, then it would work, you know. So there's all of these things going on. Every time you have a want, it will be challenged. It will be challenged every time. So if you want to turn to 2 Kings 2.9. 2 Kings chapter 2. And Elisha knew that his Elijah knew that his time was going home. In verse 6, he says to Elisha, stay here, I pray, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I'll not leave you. And the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood to watch afar off, and the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the waters, and they divided this way and that so that the two of them went over on dry ground. And when they'd gone over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I will do for you. Ask what I will do for you before I am taken from you. I still believe Jesus is asking that question because the world needs the manifestation of the want that he's placed on the inside of us. Ask what I will do for you. See, that, that means in alignment. So I'm aligned with Robert Henderson. I'm aligned with uh, Cheyenne and in a way with David MacDonald. I'm aligned with them, in particular, Robert and Che. I'm aligned, which means I can go to them and I say, I want, I have an alignment, I have a need. And I often go to Robert and say, I'm starting a fast. Would you please cover me in prayer? I want you to cover me in prayer while I fast. Covenant prayer in particular. So there's these things, you know, where we, you can draw on people that you're in alignment with. If you are not aligned with people, you can't ask them for anything. Does that make sense? So you need to think about, so, so you're aligned with Robert and Shay through me, right? Shay has an anointing for wealth. He always says money's no problem. Money's no problem. 
And so if you need, well, so I draw on the anointing that flows from Cheyan through Apostle Suzette into my life. I draw on that anointing. I draw on the anointing that she has with Robert Henderson to move in the courts of heaven. I draw on that anointing. You can draw on those things in the spirit realm. That's what an alignment is about. It is an alignment of power that you can draw upon. So when you have a want, sometimes we have to look up, not just to Jesus, but to other people. Maybe, maybe. I could get them to, to, I could draw on that anointing. Kathy Walters is a great one. You know, draw on the anointing. And, and a number of times that I've been in meetings where there's been guest speakers when I was just a baby Christian, and I said, oh God, I love the way they move in the spirit. I draw on that anointing. I ask Lord that they would, that I can have an impartation of what they're releasing. And quite often as I would pray that, they would call me out and they would pray over me. Exactly what I said. You can draw on the anointing, but you've got to have the want. You've got to have the hunger. You've got to have the desire, but it's always got to be in submission and surrender to Jesus. And so what Elisha is asking is, hey, you know what? I'm a single portion prophet, but I want a double portion. I want what you've got. You're my mentor. I'm aligned with you, and I want what you want, what you've got, but I want double that's a bit cheeky. But he got it. But the condition was, well, if you see me and are not caught up in the chariots and the angels and all the other supernatural stuff that's happening in the world, in, in the atmosphere around you, if you see me and the mantle and it drops, you can have it. So there's always a condition. Yes. Always a condition. How much do you want it? Will you do it God's will and God's way? And when you're challenged, are you going to push in and say, I'm just going to keep my eye on the I just want that double portion anointing. And Elijah said, if I can just keep my vision on him, when everything around him is swirling with chariots and angels and fire, but if I can just see him, when he releases that mantle, I've got it. How much do you want what you've got? You want what you want. How much? We have, you know, we, the challenge with our world, our Western world, is that we have become domesticated and civilised to a certain extent. I do not want to have a domesticated God. I do not want a civilised relationship with a God that is all-powerful and all-wonderful. I want the fullness of the power and the roar and the rage of God. I want to know him as he truly is and not as I think he is and not about the box that we've shoved him into because of Western religion. I want the power of God. I want to know him. I mean, Paul said, I press on to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know him. Regardless of what it takes, I want to know him. That was Paul's thing. He said, I press in. I continue to press in. And that word press actually means like you're hunting something down. It means that you're tracking it down, you're hunting it down. I am pressing in because I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know him. And so he's pressing it, he's stalking it, he's running after it. He's wanting to seize it and take it. He was not letting anything get in his way. This, how much do you want what you want? Is there anybody apart from me who's just a little bit frustrated with the level of their life? <laughs> you right? Both hands, both feet. <laughs> you know, so there's so much more in God. So much more in God. And we're not going to in encounter the so much mores of God if we're not stepping into what the want that he's placed inside us. He puts the desire within us to draw us into him, to draw us into a relationship with him, to... to to grow us in him, to strengthen our faith, to give us victory, to show us things, but also because when we step into that fulfilment, that manifestation of the want, it releases something in the world, it brings heaven to earth, and people will come up to you and say, I want what you've got. Yes. I want what you've got. I want that peace. I want that kind of a family. I want to know how you succeed at work. I want what you've got. 
We have talked ourselves out of passion and zeal because quite often, sometimes it's just not appropriate. You can't behave like that in church. Yeah, you can. Yes, you can. You can behave wild in church. You can have fun in church. I remember, I don't know if you were there, Jeunesse, but I can remember one time when we were both at the church where I was dean of the Bible college and they were having wild Holy Ghost nights, right? Wild Holy Ghost nights. And one man said to the pastor, he said, God's told me to somersault across the stage. And, God's, and the pastor said to him, well, if God's told you to do it, you better do it. So the guy somersaulted right across the front of the stage and then somersaulted all the way back and, it was, and it, the place just broke wide open, right? All the, tr all the religionism, all the tradition, all the way, this is the way I'm supposed to behave in church. Everything was utterly destroyed and the place went wild, right? The place went wild. And this is what we're hungry for, but not the way it was back then. We want the new thing, the fresh move, what God is doing now in Jesus' name. And so that's what happened. In fact, I can remember the pastor's sister who was always such a lady. And her hair was, always, it was done up in a bun on her head. And she ended up on the floor. And I can remember her crawling on her hands and her knees to get to the chair. And she just put, like, manages to put her head on the seat of the chair. And her hair's all over her head. And it is just, you know, just was not ladylike. <laughs> not together. And she says, oh God, you sure know how to show a girl a good time. <laughs> we had a time when the pastor stood up to preach. No, it wasn't him first. So the worship pastor stood up and he was nailed to the back of the wall, just, right? So then the assistant pastor stood up, took the mic, and he was nailed. And then the pastor stood up and he crumpled. And everybody in the church is going, what's going on? What's going on? Because all the leadership were flat on their faces before God. But this is what God wants to release. This kind of thing with the civilization and the domestication, I'm not saying unruly, I am saying divine order, right? But every time there's a move of God, there will always be a move of the flesh. There will always be a counterfeit trying to get in. That's why the purity and all of that is so important. But what I'm saying is God is wanting to do something new. He's wanting to release a fresh thing. There's a revival of intimacy with the Lord that's going to destroy entertainment in the church. How much do you want the new thing? How much do you want the new thing? How much do you want it? How much are you, you know, at the moment? Oh, I shouldn't even be saying this. <laughs> at the moment, there are cert there's a certain doctrine that I'm looking at, and I'm thinking, I don't think I believe you anymore. <laughs> I want the truth, Holy Spirit. I want the truth. And as he's leading me into the truth, it's going, well, I'm loving it. <laughs> but it flies in the face of general Pentecostalism. So... But I'm not prepared to share that because I'm still studying, praying, seeking. God, I don't want to be deceived. I need the Holy Spirit of truth. But seriously, this is so much better. <laughs> but I need to know the truth. So how much do you want this stuff? Are like you prepared to fast? Are you prepared to go on a word fast? When my daughter, one of my daughters, not my precious Danny, I've got precious other daughters. But when one of my daughters ran away from home, God told me to write out all the scriptures that, that showed me how he, would, how he saw her finished in the work of Christ, completing Christ, one in Christ. 
So I'm writing out all these scriptures and putting her name in it, thinking, I can't see this. <laughs> That's not, no. But anyway, God, I'm doing it. And then from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. every Friday night, I would be confessing a word fast over my daughter. I fasted. I fasted speaking words of what I thought, words of pain, loss, hurt, words of confusion. I stopped that and I concentrated on speaking God's word over my daughter. And it changed everything, changed me and then changed our relationship, changed everything. So it's doing a word fast too sometimes, not just a fast of food and drink, but actually stopping speaking what you would normally speak and just speak, releasing scripture. But what is it that you want? Because the want that was placed in you was put in there by God himself. He gives you, he gives you the desires of your heart. People think that he gives you what you desire, but no, he puts that desire in there because it will manifest heaven on earth to so many other people. We have got to come on. Like, I don't know how else to say this, but let loose. <laughs> let loose. Be a bit radical. Be a little bit wild. You know, be a bit bold. We might get into some messy situations. <laughs> but God doesn't mind mess. Jesus was always stepping into mess when he was on earth. We don't want to upset people. Hey, if people get upset by what I say, that's their choice. Right? If they, like as Mary Ann said, if they take offence, they carry the fence. <laughs> everywhere they go so it's not about that it's if I'm speaking the truth and if they know my heart and they know my heart is love that I'm speaking truth because I love them but I'm you know they know me surely we're growing up and mature enough to say things that, that truth brings freedom yes. truth brings freedom so where in your life are you not free because maybe in that area where you are not free is the area of want that God wants to manifest for your life so that you will truly live freedom. In our prayer time today, we were released, we were released from Kronos time to move into spiritual time. You really want to be led by the clock or by the Holy Spirit? What do you want to be led by? Time or the Holy Spirit? The thing that we don't get is that God also has wants. He wants the bride of Christ to be mature. He wants to see us Christ-like thought, word and action. He wants to see Christ fully formed in us. He wants the gospel of the kingdom preached to all the nations before the return of his son. He wants these things. He wants these things. But he will not invade our free will. So, what you know, sometimes I think... We take ourselves a little bit too importantly. Because surely we're here to serve the King, mm. not ourselves. We're here to serve our King. So, what is the want that He has placed in your heart that you've yet to pick up? And I have avoided prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Man, have I avoided it. That has spoke about the books I'm supposed to write. I have avoided it, turned a blind eye, deaf ear. I have, no, 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 not at this time, not in this season, no. And so somebody said to me the other day, what are you called to do? And out of my mouth came, I'm called to write books. Okay, God, you won. 
But what is it in you that needs to be manifested? And I'm not talking about anything else, just what's, what, what is in your heart? What is in your heart? And if you're not sure, sometimes we bury it. Anyone ever bury stuff? And then it takes the Holy Ghost detonator to sort of <laughs> get it out. But if you don't really quite know, why don't you start with something? I want a new job. I want to have a Shabbat a week with my family. I want to be debt free. Why don't you st start with something? Because as you start to move, God will open up everything else. But if we sit back and we wait for God to do it, he's actually waiting on us. She said there's a barrier that it, it's got the word permission on it. And it's, um, it's a hindrance, and I've, I've seen it, it's coming, and then it goes, it's coming, and it, it goes, and I think it needs to come down. Yeah. It needs to come down. Yeah. Can I actually speak to the other side of that? Yes. So well, I'm getting that clarification. <laughs> that clarification needs to come in for the sake of not sounding, for us not to interpret contradiction. So if you can maybe speak to the difference between imparting and anointing or drawing on anointing and stealing oh, and anointing. Let me tell you about stealing. Oh, let me tell you about stealing and anointing. I have people in my life that want to walk with me simply because of the anointing that I carry. They're not interested in me. They don't give a rip about me. They want what I've got. But they're not prepared to get on their knees and seek God for their own. So I was in a, I went over to a Morris Cirillo. Sound like my life is full of going overseas. It's not, but I, I was went to a Morris Cirillo meeting shortly after Open Heaven ministered, uh, ministry started, and um, that just blew me away. That whole Morris Cirillo thing, and he anointed me. There's another one I can draw on. But when he anoints you with oil, it is a bowl, and two hands, and slosh. <laughs> So you walk out thinking, I can't see anybody till I've gone to the room and cleaned up. Um, and then Rory Jensen in Brisbane, it was a ram's horn full of oil. <laughs> but when I went there, um, Judy Jacobs was speaking and she was talking on the anointing, the power of the anointing, how to protect the anointing <clears throat> and all of that kind of thing. And she had a, like a scarf and as, as, representing the anointing because it would be blown by the breeze in the auditorium kind of thing. And then she threw it. And I thought, oh, gosh, because I really enjoy Judy Jacobs. I love her music and I love her preaching. I've got several of her books. I thought, oh, Lord, you know, I would love to be able to receive an anointing from her. Guess who got the scarf? <laughs> Me, right? And it comes into my head like, Wow. And I hadn't even finished the wow. And a woman comes up and rips it out of my hand and runs off. And then Judy Jacobs, feisty little woman of God she is, jumps off the stage and chases her through the auditorium and rips the scarf out of her hands and says, don't you ever steal anybody's anointing. Oh. Right? And she went to town on this woman. I never got it back, mind you. But she went to town to this woman. But then the Lord said to me, and don't you ever allow anyone to steal it from you. You can give it as much as you want, but no one is to take it. So you have to have a discernment. And when who comes into your life or who comes into your ministry or who comes into your business, who comes into your family, what are they there for? So you protect what God gives you. You steward it, happy to impart, happy to release. You know, when Kathy Walters prayed for me, gosh, I'm a name dropper today. Um, but when Kathy Walters prayed for me, she, um, she said, everything that God's given me, I'll give to you. That, that was what she said before she laid hands on me. That was amazing. But she gave it. I didn't come along and try to steal it. I didn't come along to worm my way into her acquaintanceship or relationship so I could, you know, just be seen as being part of her. 
So you've got to be aware that that stealing, taking it, you know when people are doing that. You can feel it leaving you and you've not released it. You can, and, and quite often after somebody's attempted to steal it from you, you will feel um, empty. Yeah. And it's a different empty as to when you've been praying for people and the anointing's used up. You know what I mean? It's different. It's an emptiness. So you've got to be aware of... Um, you've got to be aware of certain people. Yeah, wolves in sheep's clothing, all that kind of stuff. So, but you're happy to release, happy to give. So um, the permission side of things, clarification is that you have to really settle this with God. God, this is what I want. I'm running it past you. Is this the want you want me to want? That's a great question. Right? Is this the want you want me to want? Get that settled first. And then keep it under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Get that settled, bottom line. Recognise that there will be challenges. But the other thing is that sometimes God is waiting for you to give him permission. The number of times that I have said, God, I love you, but I'm never going back to Uganda. You've heard me say it. God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll even go to Uganda, but you know I really don't want to. I'm putting conditions on my relationship. I'm happy. I'm sorry, working on getting happy to go to Uganda because I've got three invitations to go, which I did not look for, did not ask for, but they've come in. So I have to pray about it. So the thing is, oh, and then would you like to come across to Rwanda? Not really, but <laughs> I've been asked. So the thing is, sometimes God is waiting for you to give him permission because he will not violate free will. Sometimes we've made a vow We make vows, people. All sorts of inner vows. Vows about self-protection, self-justification, self-provision, whatever it might be, where we make vows. And so God can't do anything because those vows are in place. So sometimes we need to ask him, what are the vows that I need to repent of? What are the vows that I've not kept? What about those things, Lord? And then, God, I give you permission to do in me whatever you want to do, because that's really covenant. That's really covenant. I give you permission. We shouldn't have to give permission, because covenant is he can do whatever he wants. But I give you permission to do anything in my life that you want to do. And I truly will go anywhere you want me to go. And I truly will speak whatever you want me to speak. And I truly will do whatever you want me to do. Because I am in covenant with you. And that releases the power of Goshen over my life. And that releases revelation for me to move in. Sometimes we just have to give permission to ourselves. I give permission to myself to chase after this one. I know my family's not going to like it. I know this, you know, this might not be comfortable. I know da, 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 da. But I give myself permission because quite often we structure things around us to keep us safe or to live the life we think we should be living instead of the life that God wants us to live, which is abundant, uh, I was going to say abundant, crazy, awesome, amazing, marvellous life. You know, 
all the supernatural stuff and but just the presence of God going with you everywhere you go. Moses declared his want. God, I want you to show me your glory. See, at some stage, your want has got to become a demand. Respectful, but still a demand. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. It's got to come out of the depth of being in us. So what is it in you that is craving to be expressed in your life? What manifestation? So I'm not sure if that answers your thing on permission, Leah. Yeah, there's, uh, I still felt like there's a, there's a... There's a religious spirit in here that is stopping this. Spirit. Yes, and it is, it's like it's, um, it's rooted in, um, it's rooted in a kind of social culture and, it, and part of that's been in the church. Like, you're allowed this much when I say you're allowed this. It's almost like yeah. that. This much, that's enough. And it's, so that's why I'm seeing it opening and closing. Well, let me say right now, God has given you permission to go after everything he's got for you. Yeah. And we destroy church culture. Yes. We destroy social culture. And we destroy anything that would hinder and stop us from moving in the freedom that God's called us to move in. Because yeah. 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 if it's in the covenant, it's out. We're joint heirs with Christ. If yeah. it's in the covenant, there we go. It's and let me tell you, when you became a citizen of the kingdom, limits, limitations were removed. You've got the mind of Christ. You can think with the wisdom of God. You've got the same anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can do all sorts of incredible things. You're in Christ. Christ is in you. You are one with God, like one with God. How amazing is this? I just saw attached to the bottom of that thing is it's running out. That's more delay. Yeah, well, I break the spirit of delays because that's something in Daniel that the devil did was he created delays to weary the people of God. So any ungodly delays... I take authority over you and uproot you in everybody's life right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Be gone. And I call things into divine timing and divine order in Jesus' name. That's part of the clock. Thank you, Jesus. So there's going to be no... Um, what did we do? We did we, uh, kim, kim, hi. <laughs> communion? Is it in the kitchen? Um. Thank you. With Cambry, yeah. So yeah. Oh yeah. Look, if you know, forgetfulness can be an issue, which is the spirit of ziz, z i z. It's in the Bible, in the Hebrew. Um, but one way to combat forgetfulness is to be thankful. Give thanks in everything, and you can you combat. Ziz and forgetfulness. And drink lots of water. Okay. So, thing is, I'm not going to pray for you because you're all mature Christians. But you have to have your own relationship with God. And there are some things that we carry in our heart that we have to birth ourselves, that we can't go to the minister and we can't go to anybody and say, will you pray for me? I'm happy to agree with you if you want me to. But there are some things that God has placed in us that we need to birth ourselves. The woman with the issue of blood, she wouldn't have shared that with anybody. Elisha didn't share with anybody what he wanted from Elijah. Blind Benjamin, what's his name? <laughs> Blind Bartimaeus. <laughs> Blind Benjamin. Blind Bartimaeus. You know, he, he's just yelling out for the name of Jesus. He just wants the attention of Jesus, right? There's, there's certain things that you have to carry to God alone. I'm not saying that you can't maybe as husband and wife, but there are certain things that you have to carry and birth and manifest yourself. 
So Holy Spirit, we ask you to minister to each and every one of us right now and make sure that every time we, we follow a want, that it is God's want. Holy Spirit, we expect you to put a stop and a halt any time we step out in the flesh. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would move mightily in us, through us, with us, for us and around us. Holy Spirit, we want a fresh breath, a fresh infilling. Holy Spirit, we want to know you as the spirit of truth. And we speak right now that there will be a precision and a clarity. There will be truth in Jesus' name and we will not receive any anything that is false. We will not receive anything that is of dualism. We will not receive anything that is not of God. We speak that right now. We are vessels of God and we receive that we would be holy and pure and Holy Spirit, we surrender to your work within us in Jesus' name. Amen. But just the presence of God in any area brings a holiness. And I'm telling you right now that if you want to move in the things of God in this time and you want to move in the realm of the Holy Spirit, unless there is a holiness that he has birthed within you, you will never be able to flow in the Holy Ghost to the extent that you want because he is bringing a level of holiness to the church that we have not seen for a very long time.